Oh! Oh, you should have seen your faces. I scared the crud out of you. The only reason I'd play such a crazy gag on you is because today we're doing another dark side video. Just gonna burn through all these, baby. And today I'm gonna be doing them in Queens. I'm actually here in uh, Flushing Meadows Corona Park in front of the Unisphere, which was built in 1964 for one of the world's fairs that they had in this park. Uh, really great park. This is where they, you know, the UN was located in this park briefly before it moved to its headquarters. Also where Men in Black uh, shot. I don't know if you remember where the thing he shot, the guy who slapped Chris Rock shot down the, uh, the UFO. Uh, what's that? Relevant. Very, very relevant. Very topical, relevant. baby. I'm always topical here. Uh, but evergreen as well, as they say in the biz. A lot of stuff here. I'll cover it in a different video, don't you worry. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, before we get going, Eric, how are you? I just saw you got a bag stuck to your leg right now. It just blew in the wind and it's stuck to your body as we speak. It's all right. Doing so, good. That's all right. You know, you're so committed to your craft, you're not even going to... I don't even know. I'll there it goes. There it goes. Wow. Uh, anyways, uh, before we start the video, guys, check out the Patreon. Big help. Uh, helps, you know, fund these things. Uh, there's some extras on there, you know, uh, mostly PG. Also, too, you can check out the, uh, you know, uh, if you've seen one of these videos before, please uh, like the video, subscribe as well. That's big help. Uh, helps bump us in the old analytics above all those, you know, uh, food vlogs and stuff. Uh, but today's a dark side video. So, guys, some of this stuff will be dark. If it's too much for you, just, you know, Watch it with the sound off or something, so I still get those views. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you know we're gonna be covering some crazy stories. There's some really good ones here in Queens today, uh, some very very famous ones as well. So you're gonna want to hang out for all of them. And uh, you know, aside from that, I don't know, Eric. What do you think? I mean, I've been babbling this whole time. Should we just get started? Yeah. Will you keep it light and accessible? <laughs> you know what? I will put this in a very light and digestible format with some humor. Drag me out of this nice park. I'm going to drag you out of this nice park. We're going to bounce around the city and take you, we're going to take some taxis around the borough because it is the biggest by, by land. No big deal. You know, it's like 119 square miles, which is almost five times the size of Manhattan. You know, that's just some trivia, you know, okay. But uh, yeah, I guess, uh, what do you think? Should we just start this thing or what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get moving to our first spot. Yeah. Okay, so I'm here at 9327 222nd Street in Jamaica, Queens, in Queens Village. Uh, and it's this little house behind me, and it's the site of our first story. It is the story of the bored and shocking housewife. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just, uh, you know, trying to build the drama anyways. Uh, this is the story of Ruth Snyder. Now, Ruth Snyder was, uh, was she was a 32-year-old woman in 1927. Uh, she was in a loveless marriage of 11 years to a man named Albert Snyder, who was the uh, art editor at Motorboating Magazine. Uh, I don't know how that marriage was loveless, but a job like that. But, uh, you know, he was a little older. She was getting kind of bored. In 1925, she met a guy named Judd Gray, who was a corset salesman and she started having an affair with him. Uh, you know, motorboating art editor to corset salesman. Seems like kind of a lateral move, but <laughs> you know, she was kind of bored. Anyway, they... Upgrade to me. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I guess it's a slight upgrade. They keep their, they keep their uh, uh, you know, relationship going. They, they meet up at the Waldorf Astoria in, uh, in Manhattan, which I've covered in my Midtown video. <laughs> yeah, anyways. Uh, they, they keep it going for a few years, uh, and then in 1927, they decide, you know what? We gotta get rid of uh, old Albert so we can be together. She takes out an insurance policy, a double indemnity insurance policy on him, uh, and she decides that they're gonna murder him. So one night, you know, Albert hides in, uh, in the house while she's away, brings uh, the husband back. He comes into the room, and Albert pops out and tries to murder him with a window weight, sash weight. Uh, I've talked about these. Uh, I talked about these actually in the dark side uh, of fame, I think. And uh, anyways, sick plug either way. Uh, but uh, I try to murder him. He doesn't get. On, he doesn't go completely unconscious. So then they try sticking chloroform up his nose. They they tried strangling him. Eventually they kill the guy. Um, but uh, she went to the police claiming that someone had beaten her up and stolen her jewelry. Uh, that, that story fell apart when uh, she didn't have any bruises and her jewelry was under the mattress. Uh, you know, got, not the smartest criminals, but uh, what can you do? Uh, so they start questioning her more and more and they actually eventually ask her, who's Judd Gray? Uh, to which she replied, has he already confessed? 
not exactly professional criminal. So uh, they get arrested. Both of them start turning on each other. It's a total mess. They each blame each other uh, and they go to trial. The trial is a complete circus. Thousands of people crowd, uh, crowd the courtroom. She was trying to claim that two Italian guys uh, came into the house and, and murdered her husband. Uh, and you know, if you're gonna lie, why, why you gotta be racist? You know, you can, you can just say anything. You don't have to be like, yeah, it was two uh, Italian guys. That's who it was. So eventually it falls out. She's found guilty as is Judd Gray and they're sentenced to death at Sing Sing. Uh, January 28th, when it's sentenced to ha when it's actually scheduled to happen, uh, you know, Ruth is led into the execution room. A, a photographer for the Daily News comes in. This is where it gets interesting and shocking. Tom Howard is hired by the Daily News. He's, he's actually a member of the Chicago Tribune, and he's hired by the Daily News, which is a sister paper, uh, because they wanted to sneak a photographer in there. You're not allowed to take pictures of executions. Go figure. Uh, and they hire him because no one at Sing Sing would recognize him. And he goes in and he sneaks in with a camera on his foot. Uh, so while the actual execution is going on, he lifts his pant leg. He had a wire going up his uh, leg and uh, he started diddling with it while the thing was going. And I guess the officer saw him diddling with his pockets and just thought he was some kind of nasty freak uh, watching an execution and <laughs> playing with himself. But uh, he actually gets a picture of the actual execution. The next day on the cover of the Daily News with the headline dead is a picture of Ruth Snyder being executed to death. Uh, the first ever picture of a person being executed by the electric chair. Uh, pretty wild stuff. Uh, and remember, keep in mind, this is in the 1920s. This is before social media. I mean, today you can watch people being executed while eating your frosted mini wheats in the morning. Uh, you just go onto, I don't know, some TikTok channel or something, who knows. But, uh, but yeah, it actually ends up being a, a whole thing. And uh, actually, based on the story, a book is written by a man named James Cain called Dumbled Indemnity, which is then made into a movie by Billy Wilder. Oh, pretty cool, pretty cool. Billy Wilder, we talked about him as well. Uh, he, he did uh, Seven Year Itch, which we talked about uh, in The Secrets of New York. Look at this, I'm tying it all together, baby. There's another little, little plug for you. So her last words when she, before she was executed was actually, uh, God, please, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To which God probably replied, uh, did uh, somebody hear something? Take it on the chin, lady. Suck it up. You killed your husband. Come on, with a, with a weight and chloroform. Uh, but yeah, it all happened right here. Ruth Snyder, pretty crazy story. Uh, very famous photogra uh, photograph uh, resulting from it. Famous film, film noir, right, Eric? Yeah. yeah. It's a good movie, right? Well, it's a very famous film noir. Yeah. Is it a better movie than uh, the new Matrix sequel? Saw that coming. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. For those of you guys just tuning in, Eric recommended me the new Matrix sequel and uh, not good. But uh, yeah, this is the story of Ruth Snyder here in, uh, in Jamaica, Queens. Pretty cool story in this little house, little suburb area. Wouldn't even know what happened. But uh, what do you say, Eric? We move to the next spot, huh? All right, let's go. Let's do it. All right, so I'm actually here in Kew Gardens. I'm actually at the corner of Austin and Leffert Boulevard uh, to tell you the next story here. This is the story of the bystander effect. Ooh. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention that uh, this corner is where Rodney Dangerfield grew up. You know who Rodney Dangerfield is, Eric? Yes. Yes. I get no respect, you know? Uh, anyways, I'm here to tell you the story of Kitty Genovese, which happened in the year 1964. So this was a 28-year-old woman. She was dating a, a woman at the time, actually. Uh, and this is 1964. This is when like, the songs that were on the radio were like, do wa diddy, you know? It was very, you know, conservative time. And she actually was murdered here on uh, this street and in this building. Uh, so the story goes that she came back from work at around 2.30 a.m. There's actually a Long Island Railroad station right here. She comes out, starts walking up this sidewalk, and encounters a man named Winston Mosley right here on the sidewalk. He attacks her and starts stabbing her here in front of all these windows, all these people. She actually screams out, oh my God, he stabbed me. Someone actually looks out the window and closes it again, doesn't know exactly what's happening. Now, real quick, keep in mind, this is a woman who came back to New York City. Uh, her family had actually moved away from the city after her mother had witnessed a murder. And so she comes back and uh, she's attacked here. But like I said, she goes around to the uh, back of the vestibule and that's where uh, the rest of the story continues. So let's go there. All right, don't mind me, just trying to look loose while talking about a murder. 
Uh, well, I'm back in the area where all the vestibules are, so I was saying that Kitty Genovese, after being stabbed, initially made her way back here to the back entrance of her apartment, which is right here, uh, and fell into the vestibule. Winston had left, gone to his car, and had put on a disguise, which was just a hat. He put on a hat, and he came back. It's a pretty elaborate disguise. Might as well put on Groucho Marx glasses, but he came back and he finished the job in the vestibule. And in total, she was stabbed 13 times. Horrific crime, uh, and it happened right here. Um, now, uh, she was discovered eventually, but what actually made it more complicated was two weeks. At the, now, the initial murder got a small mention in the paper, but two weeks after the murder, the New York Times publishes a story where they claim that 38 people had witnessed the actual murder and said nothing. Um, this goes on to be studied by psychologists, you know, textbooks, it's taught in schools, and it becomes a thing known as the bystander effect, where people will watch something happen, and because there are other people watching, they won't do anything. But that all happened because of Kitty Genovese's murder right back here. And the bystander effect was really just coined because of that New York Times article. Uh, that's right, the, the failing New York Times, New York, fake news, fake news. I prefer the Rodney Danger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was pretty terrible. Uh, not a good newspaper, people. Not a good newspaper, people. Sorry, uh, I don't, not good impressions. Anyways, yeah, yeah it's terrible. Uh, anyways, uh, is the New York Times created that article and it caused a huge stir and it made that ripple effect uh, because um, in, I guess subsequently, there has been a documentary uh, made by her brother. Actually in 2015, there were other documentaries and, and coverage of that same uh, event, and they've all found that it's more likely the number was closer to six people that may have come across it in some way, and they didn't actually witness possibly the actual stabbing, as opposed to just seeing her suffering and not knowing what was going on. So it's been kind of debunked since, but the actual concept has made its way into psychology and into the popular psyche. Uh, pretty interesting. Also, here's an interesting fact. The Kitty Genovese murder was one of the reasons why a 911 system was put in place nationally. So the 911 system was put in place in 1968 as a result of that Kitty Genovese because they were actually, they say there were people who actually called the police, but it was busy, they weren't able to get through, all that kind of stuff. So 911 was put in place to kind of uh, remedy that. Huh? The so you have Kitty Genovese to thank for, for, the, for the number 911 and also the amazing TV show Rescue 911. Starring William Shatner, uh, so thanks, Kitty, for William's uh, you know follow-up to Star Trek. So it's had a huge effect on popular culture. The TV show Girls did a whole thing on it. Uh, Law and Order has done a couple things on it. Phil Oakes wrote a song called "Outside of a Small Group of Friends" about it, uh, where he actually suggested that some of the people were playing Monopoly when when it happened, which is kind of messed up. I mean, they're playing at 2:30 in the morning, one and two. I mean. You can't just walk away from, you know, uh, Marvin Gardens and, you know, collecting around Marvin Gardens to call the police. Anyways, that all, that all happened right here in this back in this vestibule and also over here on Austin Street. Personally, I think that this, this story was overblown, but it's interesting too because it shows how things that happen in New York kind of take on a life of their own. People put out a story, people, something crazy happens, the New York Times reports it or someone reports it and it just takes on a life of its own. And now the effect of that story, the actual legend of that story is bigger than the story itself. While it is tragic what happened to Kitty Genovese and everything, no one could have predicted the actual effect it would have had, uh, you know, based on things that actually didn't happen that evening. Actually, by the way, Winston Mosley went to prison. He actually escaped from Attica in 1968, was pinned on more years, actually died in prison uh, just a few years ago, actually. I was denied parole 18 times. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you think after a little while you just stop trying, you know? But uh, hey, give it to him for persevering, I guess. Um, so yeah, that all happened right here. Pretty cool. Ended on, give it to Kitty Genovese's murderer. That's right. That's right. Exactly. If there's a, if there's a moral to be had, it's persevere. <laughs> you know, in the face of right. just. I think we've worn out our welcome here. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, what do you think? Should we go to the next spot? Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Ah! So we are here at Borough Hall, Queens Borough Hall. This is the seat of the borough of Queens, one of the five boroughs of New York since 1898. There are five boroughs, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, Manhattan. Big deal, right? I've covered that in plenty of videos. One of the most important events that ever happened in New York. Uh, but this is uh, Queens uh, Borough Hall, built in 1940. The original one is over in Long Island City. We'll cover that in a different video, don't you worry. But I'm here to tell you the story of Donald Maines, the King of Queens. Ooh. All right, so let's talk about this guy, right? Uh, Donald Maines becomes the Queen's borough president. Now, the borough president today, just so you guys know, 
Uh, it doesn't have a ton of power today, but before the early 90s, they used to serve on the Board of Estimates with the mayor, the speaker of the city council. Uh, they used to have a vote in big, uh, big issues in the city, so they were very powerful. Uh, and he used that power uh, to his advantage a lot. Just to give you an idea how powerful they are today, now it's more of like a ceremonial thing. They cut ribbons and things like that. All, in fact, our current mayor, uh, Eric Adams, used to be the Brooklyn Borough President, which uh, I don't know if you guys know Eric Adams. He likes to like hang out at like Zero Bond, the, one of the fanciest nightclubs in the country. He hangs out there all. It's very weird, right? And you, you got to like you know put on your Dolce and Gabbana and your Louis Vuitton to go talk to the mayor of New York. You know, it's like, hey, I want to talk to you about the uh, rezoning in Brooklyn. I said I want to talk to you about the rezoning in Brooklyn. You know what I'm talking about, Eric? Anyways, I'm off on a tangent there. Anyways, so the Brooklyn Borough President, I'm sorry, the, the Queensborough President uh, serves here. Donald Maines is the Queensborough President. Now, what happened with this guy? So he starts using his clout to take bribes for contracts. This is a big thing. He was the head of the Democratic Party. He was, the, uh, he was a very, very uh, important figure, good friends with Ed Koch. Uh, and throughout his tenure here, he did lots of seedy things. I'll get to that in a second. 1985. November 1985, he is actually caught. In fact, his friend, who served kind of as his bag man, taking the bribes and things like that, is caught by a f uh, federal uh, informant. Uh-oh, that's a problem. So, uh, so there, he's kind of you know sweating, he's nervous, he doesn't know what to do. What ends up happening is in January 1986, Donald Maines tries to kill himself unsuccessfully. And in the next two months, slowly things start to come out as to what he's doing. He starts to kind of lose his mind. He, he sits at his house, uh, so he's kind of losing it. He's seeing a psychiatrist, always, also going to see his lawyer, can't really pay attention, can't really, uh, you know, I guess focus on anything, uh, lives kind of like in a stupor. Uh, sounds like my college experience. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, fast forward to March 1986. Uh, he's on the phone with his psychiatrist, actually, and he sticks a steak knife into his chest and kills himself, uh, which has, you know, got to be a pretty epic fail for the psychologist. Uh, but he dies, and with him dies the knowledge of who else was involved in a lot of these schemes, including the mayor of New York, possibly, who at the time was Ed Koch. But later, as, as, uh, after his suicide, more and more things come to light. He was actually uh, you know, in with the mob, had a very close mob associated who visited him a few times. Also, things come to light that he had been using city funds to pay for women and drugs from women. Uh, he was actually buying, supposedly, buying pot and quaaludes. I don't know if you guys know what quaaludes are, ludes or disco biscuits. <laughs> you ever heard of that, Eric? Disco uh, biscuits? Yes. Disco biscuits. Uh, you know, city funds going to buy disco biscuits for his ladies. Uh, and he kept I've up. never heard someone say disco biscuits three times in one second. Well, you've heard it three here. That's more times than I've said it all year, so uh, I'm already doing well. Uh, but yeah, he was buying drugs, he was taking women out, he was using the house of an associate to take women during the day. He was married with children. Uh, other things started coming to light as well, that he had, uh, he'd actually was involved in the Parking Violations Bureau scandal, which is where they were actually bribing a collections company to be the collections company for the Parking Violations Bureau. Him and his friend, uh, who ended up getting pinched by the feds, as they say. Is that a little dark, Eric? It's very dark. Sorry. Uh, anyways, but uh, the Queensboro president, Donald Maines, and his, uh, his unfortunate suicide and scandal surrounding the suicide. Uh, you know, this was his office, the Borough Hall here in Queens, and uh, we're actually in Kew Gardens, which is, uh, which is a nice, quiet little neighborhood. But uh, that was pretty dark, huh, Eric? It was dark. Would you say it was dark? <laughs> Gallows humor, you gotta make jokes about it. What else are you gonna do? Listen, guys, I mean, look, if you, uh, you gotta get on me for just, you know, trying to make things light, I don't know what to tell you. You gotta go watch something else. But, uh, well, that's pretty much it, guys. The story of Donald Maines. Why don't we just keep going to our last stop? Get out of here. Let's get. <laughs> uh, scared you again. All right, well, that's it, guys. That's it for the stories today. I thought I'd tell you some, uh, some crazy little tales, all true. You know, we started out, we talked about the bored housewife who, you know, kind of goes, goes astray and tries to get some money out of uh, her dead husband by murdering him and, you know, uh, comes a poster child for the electric chair. Then we talked about uh, the famous Kitty Genovese murder. 
uh, uh, coining the term bystander effect. Uh, I've studied in psych classes with a bunch of you know, freshman psych majors who think they know everything about everybody just for taking a psych 101 class. I'll analyze you at the family barbecue. Sorry, was that, was that too much baggage that I brought there? A little specific. Yeah, uh, yeah, a little specific. But anyways, the last story, we talked about the tragic uh, story of uh, the Queensboro president, Donald uh, Maines. So a lot of cool stuff we covered today. Uh, pretty good, pretty good video. What'd you think, Eric? It's a pretty good video. Pretty good video, man. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I guess we kind of made it here back to the back to Flushing Meadows, Corona Park. Awesome place. Uh, before we end the tour, guys, please, if you liked it, check out the Patreon. Go on there, baby. You know, uh, support that always helps. Also, too. Um, oh, and there's some extras on there. <laughs> also, too, uh, please like and subscribe to the video. If you made it this far. You probably didn't hate it, so uh, you know. Show some support, bump us above all the, uh, you know, I don't know, how to make uh, an effective mouse trap videos. Those seem to do pretty well. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. Eric, what do you think? Do, did I, am I leaving anything out? Right behind us is the Queens Museum, home to the Panorama, guys. I was actually put there for, also for the 1964 World's Fair. It's actually a scaled down, uh, very, very, very precise model of New York City. Really cool. If you ever get a chance, you should check it out. Uh, but that'll be for another video, okay? <laughs> you know, so calm yourself. Not dark enough. Not dark enough for this video. Very few things are, uh, as you can tell from what we've talked about. So, uh, yeah, I guess with that, I'll just get out of your hair. And Eric and me are going to go have a, a cotton candy. Right, Eric? Excellent. Well done. Cotton candy. Okay. Well, anyways, I'll see you guys later. Sick.